So the black metropolis was thriving. Business was good. More people had disposable income, and there was a growing demand for entertainment in the area since blacks were still not allowed to patronize white establishments. This new economic growth spurred the development of the entertainment and gambling industries in the community, which was started at the turn of the century by two business partners. John Mushmouth Johnson, who was the brother-in-law of, of Jesse Benga, and his partner, Robert T. Motts. <clears throat> Johnson partnered with Motts, who opened the Peking Theater, uh, growing out of his popular Peking Inn, which was located at 2700 South State Street. So again, this is at the turn of the century, around, the around 1900, when the development is moving from 12th Street South along State Street. The business opened in 1900 and catered to an interracial audience. The establishment of the Peking, Peking was an early catalyst for the development of an entertainment area in the black metropolis. Johnson and Motts flourished as Bronzeville grew. Johnson built enough wealth to allow him to purchase property on State, Dearborn, and Federal Streets between Harrison and Polk, again along the northern part of the black metropolis. Upon his death in 1912, Motts became a benefactor of Johnson's will. He received a substantial sum of money which, he, which enabled him to revamp the Pekin Inn and reintroduce it as the Pekin Temple of Music. It was an, an immediate success. Mott's sister and her husband, Lucy and Dan Jackson, would continue to run the theater after his death. Jackson owned a funeral parlor next to the Pekin. He would eventually create the Metropolitan Funeral Systems Association, which was one of the most important businesses on the South Side. Heart of Bronzeville was State Street and 35th. From that intersection, the area's financial institutions and entertainment venues stretched north and south along State Street. And State Street, from an entertainment perspective, was known as the Stroll. So, um, there were many clubs along the Stroll. Um, there was the Sunset Cafe, which was later known as the Grand Terrace, or the New Grand Terrace, the Apex Club, which invited late night, late night revelers and jazz fans. Um, and at day's end, nightlife really did take over. The area radiated from the hub of 35th and State, which was home also to many theaters and cabarets that were the creative home for a virtual who's who in African-American music greats, including Louis Armstrong, Jelly Roll Mo Morton, Ethel Waters, Ma Rainey, and many others. The heart of this entertainment area was home to five theaters, the Phoenix, Grand, Lincoln, Vendome, and the New Monogram, as well as cabarets such as the Elm, Fiume, and the Elite two cafes. Right around the corner and down 35th Street, there was the Sunset Cafe and the Apex Club, as well as others. In November 1912, um, Mushmouth's brother inherited the remainder of his estate and leased property at 3518 South State Street, which is across the street from the Bingo Bank, and he opened the Dreamland Cafe. This is an interior shot of the dreamland. Um, at 3030 South State Street, the Elite Cafe opened next door to the Monogram Theater. Henry Tienan Jones, a local businessman, owned the Elite. He helped Frank Leland establish his first baseball club in Chicago. And in 1915, Jones opened the Elite II at 3445 South State Street. It was known as an after-hours club, it was an elaborate building featuring a uh, white glazed brick facade. Years after performing at the Elite Cafe too, Jelly Roll Morton recalled it as, quote, the most beautiful place in the history of America's cabaret land, end quote. By the time World War I started, State Street was transformed into an economic hotspot of dance halls, theaters, and nightclubs. 
So the Sunset Cafe was home to such legendary figures as Louis Armstrong and Johnny Dodds. Later, as the Grand Terrace Cafe, it was the home of Fletcher Henderson, Earl Hines, and the Grand Terrace Orchestra. The Sunset Cafe quickly gained a reputation for engaging the city's best performers and became one of the prime locations to hear sh the Chicago sound. Performances were accompanied by floor shows that introduced latest dances to Chicago audiences. And for many years, the Carol Dickerson Sunset Syncopated Orchestra served as the house band, often accompanied by Louis Armstrong <clears throat> on the trumpet and Earl Father Hines on the piano. Many promising young artists such as Benny Goodman, Gene Krupa, Bix Biederbeck, and Jimmy Dorsey got their start at late night sessions there. In 1937, the building was remodeled for the, for the Grand Terrace Cafe, a popular club um, that had been located at 3955 South Park Avenue. Um, a new modern style stucco interior and elaborately painted interiors, including a still, in, including a mural depicting music, a, a musical theme were installed. The club operated there until 1950. Benga's achievements attracted considerable attention in both the African-American and white press of the time, gaining for his institution limited support for the established banking community. The Benga State Bank weathered the Great Depression up until 1930 when it was forced out of business. The reasons for failure were complex, owing to the devastating effects of the Depression and the swift depreciation in value of the extensive real estate that con constituted the bank's financial base. Bank examiners also revealed irregularities prompting them to state that the bank had been operated in an illegal, fraudulent, and unsafe manner, although that was proven not to be so. As a result, Bingo was arrested and convicted for embezzlement, and he began serving a 10-year sentence in 1935. But despite the alleged mismanagement of the bank, considerable support was generated to obtain an official pardon in recognition of Binga's important contributions to the African American community. Supporters included famed trial lawyer, lawyer Clarence Darrell and even some of Binga's former enemies. Uh, they banded together to circulate petitions for his release, and in 1938, their efforts were successful. Bingo was released into the custody of Father Eckert of St. Anselm's Church, who gave the 73-year-old Binga a $15 a week job as a church handyman and usher. Binga spent his last years in obscurity and died with very little public notice on June 13, 1950. There's no question that his achievements formed the cornerstone of what was once Chicago's thriving, self-supporting black metropolis. Unfortunately, most of the tangible references to Binga Chicago have almost been completely lost. The Bates apartment building was demolished in 1938, and the adjoining Binga Bank building was demolished during the 1970s. Um, and um, and uh, actually another building was b built on that site around 1990. Um, his second bank at 3452 South State Street in the Binga Arcade, shown here in a 1950s photo with um, Stateway Gardens behind it, uh, were demolished in the late 1950s. So their sites are now occupied by the campus of Illinois Institute of Technology. And with that concludes the story of Jesse Binga and the development of the black metropolis.